I'm your host, Alex Maersperger, and in season three of the Health Pulse podcast, we celebrate those changing healthcare and life sciences for the better. Previously, you've met Antonio De Castro as a guest, and in our continued globalization, we're so excited for this new phase where we get to have him as a special guest host for a few episodes focused on Asia Pacific. And now I get to pass the mic over to Antonio. Hello, everyone. My name is Antonio De Castro, and I will be your host in today's episode of the Health Pulse podcast. I'm here to give a voice to healthcare and life science leaders here in Asia. Today's subject is on genetics testing in healthcare. Understanding genetic factors and disorders is important in learning more about promoting health and preventing disease. Whether it's diagnostic testing to guide the administration of drugs or assessing an individual's risk of future disease. Today, we have an important guest who is leading the way for healthcare genetic testing here in Southeast Asia, co-founder and CEO of Nala Genetics, Levana Sani. Levana, thank you for spending time with us today. Happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So before we talk about the amazing work that Nala Genetics is doing, can you first tell us a little bit more about you? I know that your roots are coming from Indonesia, but also uh, Singapore and the U.S. is home to you. So maybe tell us a little bit about that dynamic and uh, that upbringing. Thanks so much, Antonio. Um, I started out in, uh, I grew up in Indonesia all my life, and then I went to to college in the U.S. uh, and studied biochemistry. Uh, I think a lot of uh, what I've learned today um, and being able to start a company after after school uh, really was a culmination of my early education background uh, back in University of Southern California in LA, where I met amazing professors and fell in love with uh, with biochemistry and then genetics. And after that, decided to work in Genome Institute of Singapore before I went to uh, business school back in Boston. Um, I worked for a little bit in Boston, but then decided that a lot of the problems that I was seeing in the U.S. uh, were problems that were inherently different in nature and and different in terms of the constituents that I'll be helping. So I decided to move back home and and, uh, especially in Singapore and and started Nala Genetics. So genetic testing in hospitals is quite prevalent in the U.S. and in Europe, but maybe not so much here in Asia especially developing countries like Indonesia or the Philippines. Can you tell us about why it's important that we build and develop this service uh, and also the competence that surrounds it in our region and how Nala Genetics is moving the needle on this? Yeah, it's important because genetic testing um, is a technology that um, increasingly is becoming more and more accessible to a lot more people because of the uh, decreasing in price point. Um, and also just the amount of uh, genetic capabilities, genetic testing capabilities, fortunately or unfortunately, because of COVID-19. Um, so a lot of the access and a lot of the interest in genetic testing came about maybe long before COVID-19. But I do think Uh, the pandemic brought about a lot more interest and awareness. It is important also um, that this access is given to developing markets because overall, understanding the diversity of genetic information, genetic knowledge um, um, is, is can only be grown or or can only be much more inclusive if we include data sets from these developing countries. So a very great example of this is what we're we're working on, what's called polygenic risk scores. And polygenic risk scores basically calculate a single score from many, many different common variants in in, in the human genome. It has been found that a polygenic risk score that was built on just one ethnicity compared to a polygenic risk score that is built on multiple ethnicities um, ended up becoming uh, much more much more accurate overall uh, for for this like uh, multi-ethnic one. Um, so 
it's very important globally that that we give access to genetic testing uh, for uh, developing markets and not just one one particular market or, or ethnicity at this point. Um, and also, um, I think a lot of the interest in genetic testing in this particular part of the world is also the fact that there are some diseases that are endemic to that population. We started out with leprosy. Uh, that was our first ever small scale project uh, where we tested about thousand people and uh, was trying to particularly prevent Dapsone hypersensitivity syndrome from happening in Papuan population, population in Papua, um, who had a high prevalence of this biomarker called HLA-B1301. So that type of story, that type of biomarker was unique to that population. So it was important that the local capability and the local access was given to this type of population. That's excellent. Um, do you have any recent local or regional uh, use cases where you're putting in the, you know, you're operationalizing the genetic testing in the hospitals, maybe here in Singapore or in Indonesia? Yeah, we are excited to actually share about our project with Raffles Medical Group. Uh, so the project with uh, one of the private hospitals in, in Singapore is interesting to us because they wanted to test a uh, uh, population who are at risk of about for, of uh, taking a certain chronic medication um, and uh, they would test them regardless of whether or not they're sick um, but they would they would fe they feel like this important is, is important for them to have in the beginning um, such that when they actually get sick this genetic information is already stored within their electronic health record um, as an important information such that doctors can act upon it at the right time, right place, in the right setting. This is what's called preemptive pharmacogenomics. Um, and it's one of the first implementations in, in Singapore, if not Southeast Asia. Um, and the important aspects of this project is much beyond the testing itself. Because the testing itself for, for germline testing, your information, your genetic information, doesn't change um, throughout your life. There are, but there are many different points in your life where this information might be important for you or for your doctor. So how do we manage this information such that it pops up at the right time and the right place for the doctor such that the doctor can act upon this information correctly becomes a big, an equally big aspect to the testing outside of the testing. And so uh, we worked a lot with the hospital system on cybersecurity um, approaches, as well as what was the right best practices advisory to show when a patient actually has genetic information um, in front of them uh, when they come visit, you know, this clinic or this hospital. So we're very excited about that, and and hopefully. Um, get to see other hospitals also approach uh, genetic testing in this mass screening uh, way. Okay, great. So maybe let me uh, uh, pick on that preem preemptive or preventive side of uh, things that you mentioned, right? Because I think, you know, we've all seen uh, these graphs where, you know, uh, they say that your health, your general health, especially when we're speaking about holistic health, 40 to 50 percent is determined by by your DNA, your your genetics. And then there are certain uh, you know proportions about uh, your your lifestyle, your environment, and the treatment that you receive. So maybe my question is, you know, in case where through genetic testing we identify that someone is at high risk of, let's say, developing a breast cancer. How much can we really change, right, in terms of prevention and in terms of outcome? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and um, I would answer it, I guess, in two ways: in the level of the person, and maybe the level of the payer, which uh, prevention sometimes brings about conversation of. So, in the, in the patient level. Uh, we've done surveys or we've asked a lot of people whether or not knowing someone's knowing a, your risk of developing a certain condition um, is going to bring about good change 
that change or no change at all. And uh, people fall into different spectrums of these three options, but in general, they were uh, ready to make good changes in their lifestyle if there were something to do about it. So um, our ability to map people into high risk versus low risk need to be balanced with um, a good, actionable, and clinically implementable uh, uh, recommendations. So in the patient level, they know exactly what they need to do when they receive the report. Um, and this, this report then becomes important at any point of their life um, because there's, there's no such thing as too early to, to kind of um, uh, to kind of take charge of your health. But I think on the payer perspective, uh, the question becomes a little bit more complicated because there's this idea of cost effectiveness on a population level. They'll start asking questions like, okay, if we have to start mammogram earlier for someone with high risk for breast cancer, for example, how early do we need to start it? And do we need to rec recommend this person to start mammogram every year? Is it mammogram or is it ultrasound? You know, different approaches on, on actually doing this intervention. At the end of the day, um, uh, they would look at whether or not it increases quality of life of their population and um, whether or not the cost that, that it requires actually is commensurate with the impact that it's, it's making. In general, a lot of these population stratification projects um, ended up being cost effective in the population or at the payer level. A lot of publications have already mentioned this. Um, so I think it's, it's a very exciting time as a company um, caring a lot about prevention and Singapore as well. Uh, that just announced, you know, a big a big move towards this as a country uh, to be implementing some of these genetic testing uh, to ensure that early intervention can be implemented earlier, not to everybody, but to those who really need it. Okay, great. So maybe let me change uh, pace here. Uh, there is now push towards what we call consumerism in healthcare and how patients have more information now in their hands about their condition and personal health inf information, as well as maybe the different risks that they have based on their profile. How is this new trend affecting your organization or your company? We're, uh, we see it a lot, first of all. I think, I think that's, that's the cool part. Um, and it, it's a lot to say in this part of the world, Antonio, because I think you know as well, you know, being an Asian culture, right, is that um, you, you really regard and you really um, uh, value uh, hierarchy and you put a lot of credibility in your doctors and what they say. And so, um, you know, being having patients uh, much, in a much more participatory way of, of their own health care um, is actually a very good trend. And it actually puts uh, the physician as at a much more, um, uh, I guess, uh, they need to take it into account what they say to their patients at the end of the day. Um, so first of all, we see it. Uh, and second of all, I think it comes in the way that we service the patients. We have a mobile app uh, that, that we give to the patients every time they have done testing. And this app, the coolest part about this app is that, you know, for the patient, it looks very simple. Uh, we designed it such that, you know, it's a clear yes, no kind of things that you need to see about yourself and what drugs you can take, what nutrition, when you need to start screening. But uh, one of the projects that we have with one of the public hospitals in Singapore is kind of um, um, a, a different version of report that they can sh that, that, that doctors can see uh, by showing a QR code on their mobile app. So the, the question was like, how do we create a very simple report for patients such that so that patients can be uh, participating in their health a lot more, but then give um, a, a personalized clinical decision support for the doctors whenever they want to see it. So then um, we have this, this QR code where the doctor basically goes in to scan that QR code and put in the patient NRIC so that they can see the level of evidence of this recommendation, you know, uh, clinical guidelines, 
and and even clinical decision support um, if they need to to be able to act upon that report. So we're very excited for for where this trend is going, and hopefully we can invest a lot more in our mobile app. Maybe let me touch upon another uh, part of the whole puzzle that you evoked around, uh, well, data privacy, right? Data privacy, data security, sharing, all of that, because it's not it's not given, especially in when we're dealing with health data. Um, without going too much into detail, what would be maybe some of the you know roadblocks or big hurdles that that you would advise people to to focus on when they're embarking on on uh, such uh, ventures in terms of sharing data, especially health data and genetic data? Yeah, we generally um, there's uh, different standards that that. Uh, companies can adhere to, but uh, uh, because it's such a new field, oftentimes these standard uh, ended up being self um, uh, self assessing uh, to a certain degree. And uh, so, for example, like HIPAA compliance or PDPA compliance, yes, it is. You know, it, it, there are standards, but. Um, the the rule is that if there is no breach um, or it's there it's there's no material damage there won't be any like you know annual audit that the government does or anything like that so to a certain degree there are standards that companies can follow but to the the, the degree of how you want to invest in the cybersecurity um, uh, measures is really up to each company and. I think that's where, especially as we work with a lot with with hospitals, that's where an open conversation is really helpful, uh, where we ask them what their standards are and get that checklist ahead of time uh, to be able to integrate genetic information, for example, to their electronic health record system. Uh, there are certain standards after that that, that we kind of uh, talk about and make sure that we we are on the same page on. Um, on the patient side, I think one important um, concept that we always follow is that, uh, the, you know, the patient has to consent um, and, you know, making sure that this consent form is always a part of the testing and is shared with the hospital system and is a part of, of, of the, the, you know, every single data access and being able to access that consent from, from the patients. Um, as easily as possible is, is key to data sharing, um, I think, um, overall from different institutions. So as long as that's well you know, kept, I think it, it should be okay. So maybe let me ask you a question more on the, let's say the startup scene, uh, particularly here in Asia, right? Being an Asian woman who's a CEO, you are representing two fronts, right? Both the diversity side and gender equality. Do you think it's tougher for someone with your profile or specifically maybe on our region, which is known to be more conservative? Yeah, no, thanks so much for asking that question, by the way. Um, it, it, is, it is challenging. Um, I think regardless of, of whatever gender and, and um, ethnicity, right, being a founder mm -hmm. is already pretty difficult. But I think the... Uh, <laughs> The, there's a gr other responsibilities of being a woman uh, where sometimes, you know, certain priorities kind of clash, um, especially, um, especially in the, you know, when you're, when you're starting out, it's very difficult to kind of raise um, what people say are like two different babies at the same time. <laughs> one is the human <laughs> kind and one is the company kind. So a lot of people struggle with that. My, my co-founder is a mom. Uh, she's managing it um, uh, really well. So I have a lot to learn from her. Uh, but it's been, it's been a fun ride and I'm learning a lot along the way. And I have a lot of people to help support me. The community is great here in Southeast Asia. So if anyone is actually looking to build a business, I think the community here is super supportive. We like to end the Health Pulse episodes with optimism. So I would like to ask you, with all of what's going on in the world uh, right now, in the past uh, difficult years we've had yeah. due to the pandemic and uh, other things, what is it that makes you feel positive about the future? <laughs> Great question. I think I'm, <laughs> I am, uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that, um, uh, I, I think optimism comes from gratefulness and, um, I'm grateful for everything that, that I get to do. Um, and 
being surrounded by people who are as passionate about you know this this industry and the sector um um and and wanting to fight for it whatever at the end of the day um you know the, the bad news that we see um i'm confident that you know whatever happens in the future we are learning from our mistakes and our you know even with the way that we handle the pandemic uh, people are already looking to see how we can handle the next pandemics better and i've seen my own country do that um in indonesia and um you know setting up the infrastructure now such that in the future uh can handle it much better so i've seen it with my own eyes i'm very optimistic and hopefully uh we get to see um, a much better recovery next time around thank you levy for an insightful discussion i'm sure we will hear more from knowledge genetics in the future To our viewers, we are always grateful for the time you spend with us. I hope that this episode shown you Asia's competence and passion for the healthcare industry. As always, we are happy to hear from you, so please re- reach out to us uh, in the comment section below or email us at thehealthpulsepodcast@sas.com. Thank you. Thank you.